Good morning. We are ready to begin the opening plenary. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Marie Lee Brunt of ESA to give the welcome address. Good morning, everybody. Uh, that was a lovely, uh, rowdy, engaged uh, buzz in the room already. Uh, I'm, I'm Murray Labrant. I'm the director of the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research, uh, who have, have the great privilege of, uh, of being called the hosts. Uh, so, so how come we're the hosts? Uh, well, uh, it it's really turns around the, 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 re the real host, the chair of the conference uh, committee, Abuna Oduro here, who's a, 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 a beloved colleague of ours in the African Center of Excellence, a, a, um, one of the leadership of the Ghanaian team that works with us in ASA. Um, and, uh, and it's our privilege, really, to come alongside her to, to host this year's, this year's conference. Um, and uh, uh, so, so ASA, uh, ASA's work really is, uh, is designed to, to, uh, to produce good research, good capacity building, uh, and engage with government and civil society to actually make a difference in the, in the fight against inequalities on our continent. Um, and of course, uh, gender inequalities are profound and one of the most difficult uh, parts of, of that story. Um, and so, again, it's, it's our privilege really to, to be part of this particular conference um, that, uh, that seeks to, to envisage uh, or envision feminist economic strategies for an equitable and sustainable world. So as, as the host, I got, got to be part of the conference uh, organizing committee. And that discussion, crafting that uh, statement as the purpose of our conference, was a very long discussion um, and, uh, and purposeful. And so I know that uh, you know, there, there's a call for papers and people uh, participate. And we want to be as inclusive as possible in the papers at the conference. But, but uh, crafting the purpose of the gathering I don't want to put pressure on you guys in welcoming you to the conference, but we are actually seeking to envisage something. And there's many sessions on the program that are actually about, okay, so given that purpose and given our research, how do we then take forward the agenda? Uh, so so there, there is a seriousness of purpose about this that, that uh, is, is rather wonderful. Um, and, and part of, part of our work has been to, to, to ensure very strong African participation, to meld in. We know how long you've been at this uh, cause, at this struggle, bringing your research, bringing your capacity building. We know, and, and, this, and it's so wonderful. We're greatly privileged to have you all here. There's been an amazing uh, participation and, uh, and lovely, Lovely to have very strong African uh, representation at this particular table. So, uh, so I'm going to say, okay, so you, you get to open the conference. Well, it's, it's been open already. We're on, our we're, we're on our way. Since Tuesday, there were amazing training sessions happening at, on UCT campus. And, and yesterday, there was this uh, pre-conference and mentoring sessions and, and a, an awesome session last night. I think you will all agree. Uh, so we're on our way, and it even set the tone perfectly. So, so thank you so much. Uh, it it's really is a great privilege and a pleasure to, to welcome you here and uh, to, to uh, wish you all the best for our deliberations and what we do going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for these um, words of welcome. So good morning again to all of you um, present here. And good morning and probably good afternoon to those participating um, online. 
And thank you, um, indeed, Mary Fox, um, accepting um, the invitation for um, ESA um, to host um, this conference. This was after uh, the, the discussions we had um, many months ago. And indeed, we could say that the conference has um, started with um, a big bang. We had a very um, good session um, yesterday where we discussed the debt crisis and the climate change crisis and how this also intertwines with issues um, of gender um, equality. We know that many, many countries on the African continent, as well as around the world, are mired in debt and with the attendant uncertainties and vulnerabilities that the current proposed so solutions, and yesterday we talked about austerity being given a different name, but the proposed solutions to addressing the problems that they, um, these measures um, create. And as Marie said, there was quite a long deliberation during the program committee to decide on the theme for this conference. And there was one thing we all gained a consensus on, that we want to be forward looking. Yes, the challenges are there, but let us see what we could do to make suggestions to um, make things better or to change um, the paradigms. So that's how we arrived at um, the conference um, theme. The four panelists um, who we have here, we have three in person and we have one panelist who is um, going to um, join, the, um, join us online, accepted um, to be here and to speak um, on the um, conference theme. So the theme for the conference is also um, the theme for this um, opening um, plenary. Before we start, I would like to say um, some thank yous. We have said thank you to ESA, and um, I would also like to say thank you to the local um, planning committee, Marie Liebrand, Hajira Iso, and Charmaine Smith. Thank you very, very much. We also want to acknowledge the major funders of um, IAFE and the conference, and these are the Hewlett Foundation, the Wellf um, Wellspring Foundation, and Co-Impact. And we've had financial um, supporters for our um, travel grant. This is the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And apart from the travel grant, we also had um, support for yesterday, yesterday evening's event and for the um, conference school that we had um, on the 4th and the 5th. And this is the Institute for Economic Justice based in Johannesburg and IDEAS, the International Development Economics Associates. I want to be able to also say thank you to some individuals who supported, provided support um, for travel. And these are Nata Duvery, David Negus, Cheyenne Osterich, Vivian Ventura Diaz, Rose Camille Vincent, um, the FDR, Anna Androsik, and then INET, I-N-E-T, um, the Young Scholars, um, YSI, I'm sorry, right now I can't remember what it stands for, apologies. But this wasn't put, this, was, this conference was put together with the support of many in IAFE, and I quickly want to acknowledge the support of the IAFE Program Committee, thank you, the IAFI um, Paper Selection um, Committee, and the IAFI Pre-Conference and Mentoring Workshop Committee that put together an awesome um, workshop um, yesterday, the IAFI Travel Grants Committee. And for the first time in IAFI, we're going to have a poster session, and the posters are going to be um, up above us. And we are going to give a prize for the best poster, as well as the poster of honorable mention. And so I'd like to acknowledge um, the um, jurors who are going to have this task of identifying the best um, price. And to the conference school team, thank you. And then to our conference artwork, Mbali Chabalala. And we need to acknowledge um, her work. And then we have our IAFI members and our conference staff, Milena. Thank you for answering my WhatsApp messages at midnight. <laughs> Mumbi Kasumba, Paulina Sikias, Andrea Collins, and Caroline Domain. 
Thank you all very much. So now we are going to get into the business of the opening um, plenary. Okay. So, um, in terms of the structure of this morning's um, presentation, we have our four speakers, and they are each going to speak for 15 minutes. And then, after their presentations, we are then going to open um, the floor um, for discussion, comments, observations, questions, um, and answers. So, our first speaker this morning is Louisa Nassif Pires. And she is the director of the Research Center on Macroeconomics of Inequalities at the School of Economics, Business Administration, and Accounting at University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She holds a PhD in economics from the New School for Social Research and is a research associate in the Gender Equality and Economics Program at the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College, where she lectured in the graduate programs in economic theory and public policy. She will soon be joining the Economics Institute at the University of Campinas as an assistant professor this upcoming semester. Her main theoretical references are feminist economics, intersectional political economy, and input-output methods. And her research focuses on public policies with an application to gender and racial inequalities, the care economy, inflation, taxation, and social protection. So Louisa, the floor is yours. Do you want to come up or do you want to sit? Okay, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. To start by thanking Abina, Andrea, Mumbi, and Ipac, and all the other organizers of this beautiful conference, congratulate on this very positive and forward-looking theme that you all chose this year to salute my colleagues at the table. I quería también hacer un saludo especial a mis compañeras de América Latina, Verónica, Alma, Noelia, Corina, Valeria, tantas otras que aquí están. Disculpenme por hablar en inglés hoy. <laughs> I feel extremely honored to be speaking here today, and I also feel the weight of speaking up for Brazil and Latin America. I would like to speak directly to the theme of the conference this year, which is envisioning feminist economic strategies for an equitable and sustainable world. I'm going to have to be honest, it was not easy to put these words together today because I have been thinking for at least two years on how to envision uh, feminist economic strategies for Latin America and Brazil. And I still have no definite answers, but I'll draw here some of the strategies I've come up with my compañeras along the way. So the problem is that more frequently than we would like, there are contradictory goals between feminism, economics, and sustainable development, especially if we're not evaluating a national policy for, it, say, the US or a European country. So let's just start with feminism and economics. Economists are extremely uncomfortable making normative decisions. They came up with the most empty, status quo-preserving, well-being criteria imaginable, I'm talking about Pareto, in order to never need to take a normative position in their whole lives. So the whole discipline was built in such a way to ignore contradictions and simply put, have growth as the final goal. So meanwhile, feminists should have ending discrimination and achieving gender and racial equality as their goal. And honestly, growth and gender equality won't always go together. There are innumerable contradictions between, for example, growth in the US and racial equality in the global south. And I bet that the feminists and all of you here don't need me to prove this statement, while the economist side of some of you might just really need me to cite some very good peer-reviewed econometrics paper to make this statement. <laughs> so even feminist economists keep trying to run models hoping that the results will be that increasing gender or racial equality will bring about sustainable growth. But what if it doesn't? What if gender equality does bring growth to the global north, but only at the cost of even more inequality in the global south? What if the best strategy for the global north to build a greener and gender equal national economy is to renew colonial relations? 
So I beg to those running models for their developed countries not to exclude from their analysis when, what impact certain policies will have on women across the globe. That's not feminist economics. To be a feminist economist is to bring to light such intrinsic contradictions of the economic discipline. Those of you that have been working on the more theoretical and methodological strands of our discipline have gone very far in showing that. And I thank you all for the tireless work you have been doing. Those of us doing empirical work, we really need to catch up with you. You have shown that unless we change the meaning of economics, feminist economics is an oxymoron. I actually realized that right after I presented my first paper to an IAFI crowd. I had it hard enough with my heterodox colleagues that did not think that what I was doing was economics. I thought that IAFI would be my safe space only to come here and be accused that what I was doing was not feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, the, immense, the amazing Nancy Fobre was on that session to defend me. Turns out that even she has been going about life being accused of not being an economist in some instances and not being feminist in others. <laughs> and if that wasn't hard enough, feminist economists today have an extra challenge. They are forced to find a way to resolve a three-dimensional problem and take together three criteria, growth, gender equality, and environmental sustainability. As I already said, feminist economics have shown that by construction, our economic system reinforces gender and racial inequality. Or as Jayati brilliantly put yesterday, it's not that our system is gender blind, it is gender exploitative. So basically, our first two dimensions are already irreconcilable with each other within traditional economic perspectives which means that the feminist strategy for an actable and sustainable world needs to pass by building an alternative economic framework. Let's call this our ultimate goal, which we know will take a while to achieve. So this means that we also had to come up with some short-term strategies to improve women's lives within the existing and very resilient current economic system. Because let's face it, not even a global pandemic and a war have actually brought about a new economic order. All it did was to make it even worse for racialized women and even better for rich white men around the globe. One very useful short strategy, let's call it the know your audience strategy, I actually learned from IAFI's president, IPEC's amazing work on care infrastructure, which is to push for such policies that actually walk that fine line and bring about gender equality and growth in a sustainable way, such as care policies, and present them by showing the economic advantages that they have to policymakers. So you do not go to your very white, upper-class finance minister that never changed a sheet in his life and talk to him about the importance of women having access to childcare. Unfortunately, he's not gonna care. You talk to him about how much bigger of an impact public spending on childcare infrastructure have when compared to public spending on physical infrastructure. So basically, you accept the sexism of your policymakers for the sake of that conversation, which can be extremely uncomfortable and frustrating and is not necessarily the right strategy to achieve our long-term goal, which would require us to actually fight the sexism in our policymakers. So now, not only we need to build alternative economic frameworks, we also need to end patriarchy. It's a very tough job. <laughs> for that, we absolutely need to reach out, uh, out to reach out of our discipline and out of academia and to be connected to grassroots movements and push for the claims within our discipline. I believe a great strategy for this is illustrated by the amazing work that my Latin American colleagues are doing on fiscal justice. Let's call it the Build Alliances strategy, which is to push for feminist perspectives within progressive networks. It is exhausting work that involves building networks with feminist human rights and social justice movements and presenting how the feminist perspective is a very useful tool to advance progressive policies in general. In the case of tax reforms, for example, it means to show on the one hand to feminist movements the importance of engaging in the conversation, and on the other to show progressive economists that by incorporating the gender lenses, they can have feminists by their side. By the way, I highly recommend attending the session that Alma Spina is sharing right after the plenary for those interested in learning about their work, and especially those that don't speak Spanish. This is a very rare opportunity of having uh, the presentations translated. So I honestly feel extremely pessimistic about the future coming from Brazil. 
there was nothing more frustrating than being able to finally fight the extreme right in the country, electing a president whose inauguration speech was all about fighting inequality in its multi-dimensions, having colleagues composing the government, I really have an entry there, and then realizing that it just feels impossible to advance any gender-sensitive policy. So my personal only way forward in Brazil thus far has been to reach out to feminist economists and policymakers around Latin America. That's some more personal advice here. So surround yourself with feminist economists. It's like having a little therapy group. So this is also <laughs> one personal strategy that I think we need to have. Brazil has very peculiar problems. We are a 200 million population country with a constitution that guarantees universal public health and education, but that have one quarter of the income at the hands of the top 1% earners who pay less taxes than the previous percentile. And this, one of the reasons for that is because since 1996, individuals do not pay taxes on profits and dividends in Brazil. We don't have foreign debt, but we do have a self-imposed spending ceiling. And currently, our basic interest rate is set to almost 14% annually. We do not have a time use survey, nor yet a national care policy network. We have the largest army of paid domestic workers in the world, with 5.4 million women, the majority of which are racialized women, with an informality rate of 75%, which is twice as high as the rest of the country, and an average income which is less than half the minimum wage. So the strategies I've been coming up with Brazil passes by just plainly showing off this type of problem that we have. So capitalism is obscene enough that it speaks for itself. We just need to be able to translate it. <coughs> So the strategy that my colleagues at Maggi and I have been following, I'm going to call that the show capitalism's face strategy. So basically, we expose this, uh, these economic obscenities and translate heterodox economics into accessible language. We do that by publishing all of our research in open access policy notes. We also share all of our codes on GitHub and have a network of journalists that write about our results on newspapers. This means making simple studies and writing them in understandable ways. One of our most impactful work was a very simple analysis of racial and gender inequality in Brazil. We found that white men in Brazil that belong to the top 1% of the distribution appropriate more income than all black women in the country. As soon as we finished the piece and shared with the journalist, she asked me to rewrite the result in terms of numbers. So here's another strategical tip for us. Think about how you are communicating your results. The headline that she suggested, 700,000 white men appropriate more income than 33 million black women, was shared by many mainstream media outlets, which would not have been the case if we wrote that in percentages as we had it originally. So finally, to reach our ultimate goal of overthrowing the mainstream economic framework, we first need to come to a consensus on a proper feminist anti-colonial framework. And for that, we need regional alliances to strengthen the participation of those within our networks, and IAF is one of those networks. We are facing multiple crises, which optimists have been claiming to be an opportunity to build a new economic system, one that brings about justice and sustainability. Pessimistics like myself need, nonetheless, to warn us about the risks of such overlapping emergencies to end up being yet another opportunity to renew old colonial relations, for us to enter just a new phase of the same old racialized capitalism. I don't believe anyone has yet a solution to this problem, but we all know the only way to achieve consensus around such solution is to think about the problem from the perspective of those that have been oppressed by the system we built which means that those that have privileged in some ways from the current system, and honestly, that includes absolutely everyone in this room, in one way or another, many of us much more than others. So going back to where I started, as feminist economics, economists, we cannot be afraid to point out our contradictions, not even our personal contradictions, even if that makes us feel uncomfortable and incoherent sometimes. Mm -hmm. For example, how absurd is that I'm delivering this talk in English and not in Spanish? <laughs> it is by resolving contradictions that we reach change. Denying that we have profited from racialized colonial relations only reinforces those. I believe this conference is an important step within IAFI for us to build together a sound strategy for a sustainable world. 
So I want to finish by pleading to all of you in your own work to explore any contradictions you may find. And on those working on policy from a global north perspective, at the very least, to be explicit about the consequences of any policies you're studying on oppressed groups and on the rest of the countries. So much like Nancy Fobre advised me, don't be afraid to be told that you are not an economist. My personal advice is to more and more reduce the instances when you are accused of not being a feminist. Because resolving the internal contradictions of feminist economics as a discipline is the way to build a revolutionary economic, economic alternative framework. Thank you. very much, Louisa. It's a good start off to the conference and to this plenary. <laughs> and you stayed within time. <laughs> so our next speaker is Professor Edith Dinong Faswana. She is the Director of Graduate Academic Programs at the Tabo Mbeki African School of Public and International Affairs at UNISA. She previously served as head of UNISA's Strategic Institute um, called the Thabo Mbeki African Leadership Institute between 2018 and 2020. She also led and taught in prestigious programs, including the US presidential program called Young African Leaders Initiative at the Thabo Mbeki African Leadership Institute and the Mandela Institute for Development Studies Leadership Program. Dinong is a multi-ethnic awardee, scholar, activist, practitioner, Having featured in the 2021 Public Sector Magazine, the 16th edition of Standard Bank Top Women Leaders Magazine, the Mail and Guardian Top 100 Women Changing South Africa 2019, Stepping Up, a New Generation of South Africa's Leadership 2013, and the Leadership for Social Justice Award 2006. She is also the co-editor she is also the co-editor of the NIHSS award-winning title, Black Academic Voices, The South African Experience, 2019. She publishes in the areas of African development, equity and transformation, leadership, governance, and public policy. Edith, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chair, for your generous introduction, and good morning, everyone. Uh, the next voice you are going to hear is not of an economist. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing here. As, uh, <laughs> okay, IFE is one of those uh, feminist global connections working together to transform economic powers, and I think that's how far I know about it, some of the things that IFE has been doing, and it is an honor for me to be here today. It is my first time to meet all of you or to meet this network of esteemed scholars, and it, uh, I would like to commend the IFE uh, Collective and all other feminist uh, economics who have worked hard to improve the discipline of economics for the betterment of everyone, including the environment. Uh, for pushing us to question uh, economic models and how they affect different groups of people at macro and micro level. Networks such as this have contributed significantly for the frontiers of economic analysis and because it deals with questions of power, how the economy is structured, how we make de economic decisions, how we raise and allocate resources, and the way in which gender equality and women's work uh, is, is counted. And I think for me, uh, feminist economics become this liberatory project which seeks to produce a just world order. Uh, in, and I have already made a disclaimer that I'm not an econ economist, but I ran, I'm just going to give you a little background, I ran away from an economist class many years ago <laughs> and opted for sociology and later development studies uh, for many reasons. First, maybe the economics departments were not teaching gender and development at all. 
and uh, despised, scoring good marks in economics, the lecturer and the class was highly male dominated mm -hmm. and also made us to feel less valued in the class. So I could not connect. There was absolutely no encouragement for us to continue at all. And also during my time without revealing too much about my age. <laughs> <laughs> A book like If Women Counted would not have made it to the reading list at all at the time I was at university, uh, even though it was already published by the time I was at university. So uh, I ran to a sociology class and also I encountered problems in a sociology class because I was missing in the picture in a class which was supposed to be talking about society. And that is in the context of apartheid South Africa. So. I'm giving this background with the intention and hope of helping us to understand why sometimes, despite our good intentions, we may not make the impact that we want or we are envisaging in the world. And, and my submission this morning in envisioning uh, economic strategies for an equitable and sustainable world will lean on decolonial thinking. And the theme of the conference requires us to come up with forward-looking solutions that will lead to equitable and sustainable futures, which I've been asking myself for the past few weeks, do I have those solutions? Do I have those solutions? And I think you have framed it very nicely for me uh, when, you say, when you were presenting. Uh, however, without us being able to confront some of the darker side of modernity as scholars, uh, other scholars would argue, we may not be able to see the feminist futures that we would like to see. And, and my inputs are biased towards decolonial epistemic thought, uh, because in decolonial thinking, we unmask invisible power structures that seeks to sustain domination, oppression, and marginalization, despite the intention and the movements for change and paradigm shifts. As we are all aware, feminism is about social and economic justice, and they are both against discrimination, exploitation, and marginalization. And economic justice cannot be achieved in an imperial, heterosexual, patriarchal, capitalist, violent world where we live today, where other ways of being are peripheralized, undermined, and objectified, uh, and are facing numerous uh, political, economic, social, and cultural constraints. And I'm speaking here as a black woman of the South who finds Herself constrained by global geopolitics and the legacies of uh, slavery, colonialism, and imperialism, apartheid up to this day, within the racial capital of the world known as South Africa. And today, we are hosting this conference in Cape Town, South Africa, in the context of a major global crisis in our geopolitics. The conflict in Sudan and the Horn of Africa, which are overshadowed by, for a lack of a better of wit, seemingly critical conflict of the world, of world importance, the Ukraine and Russia. And even our leaders can fly over to go to Ukraine and leave Sudan here. It is therefore my contention that it is a challenge to sit here and imagine an equitable world within global power structures that are so highly asymmetrical, at least in the eyes of women of the South, Africa in particular as well. So the war in Ukraine has not made, made it easier for BRICS countries with their in pursuit for de-dollarization. It has even made it difficult for countries such as South Africa who are neutral on this, on this war, regarding this war. Uh, also the, even made more complex by the warrant of arrest that has been already issued against pre pre uh, President Putin. And we have seen how the war as well is impacting us here at home. Commodities such as sunflower, sunflower oil, we know sunflower oil. We, we just saw the prices going up. And you know it's a scarce resource right now, for sunflower in this country. And as we incorporate feminist thinking in economic, in analyzing as well, we see how the war is affecting us. A woman selling maguinha, Maguinha is donuts in South Africa, or you call them fat cook in Africans. I don't know other languages, 
But Maguinha used to be one rand. In Johannesburg today, I buy Maguinha for two rand. So the price of Maguinha has doubled. So already that woman who sits on the street selling fed cook every morning is in trouble because of what is happening also uh, in, in, in Ukraine at the moment because the price of Maguinha has actually uh, uh, increased significantly. Next month again, in August, we will be sitting here in South Africa. The BRICS summit will be here. And it should be marking, I think it's the 13th gathering, if I'm not mistaken. But if all goes according to plan, the next summit will be remembered for the audacity of BRICS countries to challenge the Western-led world order by expanding BRICS and the proposal for a common currency. These are already on, 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 the, on the books. The list of countries seeking to join BRICS is also increasing with approximately 18 countries seeking to join the bloc. So the growing division in, jo in global geopolitics has exposed the risk of relying on a single currency in international transactions. Actually, the US dollar, as we know, the hegemony of the US dollar. And while it's still premature, when I think about it, to think that the dollar can be replaced, I mean, even the euro has not been able to, to do that. But it's, while it's still premature, I would like to underscore that what we might see coming is the shift, how global monetary systems might shift from unipolar regimes of the US dollar to multipolar regimes of yuan, dollar, euro, pound, maybe in the future, maybe the rent, I'm not sure. <laughs> this will be the greatest move since the, the Bretton Woods. So some of the reason for de-dollarization movement is linked to how the U.S. failed to manage its fiscal position uh, responsibly, abusing its privilege of reserve currency status, weaponizing it for foreign control. So these are some of the reasons why you see many countries are also uh, buying into this. So the British countries have come to a realization that as part of imagination, it is no longer useful to hold on things that are not beneficial to their economies. They are attempting to cut off the anchor. However, they will, will they be able to use what works for everyone, not just a subsection? Because in most cases, these moves, these revolutionary ideas come in, but they never benefit uh, the whole uh, population, or if more so women they are not going to be the beneficiary in all these moves. And there is always power when revolutionary ideas are being promoted from the global south. Uh, uh, but do they really transform the lives of people living in the, in the global south as well? How the global south responds to this crisis usually is about the leaders sacrificing everyone else in order to live better. And this is also what is problematic about all these movements, the de dollarization and I'm not seeing where BRICS, um, what's that group, uh, the BRICS Feminist Watch. I, I'm not, I have not seen anything yet that came from them in the statement. And if they are here, I will be very happy that you can tell me what, 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 what kind of statement are you putting in the next summit. Instead of, uh, instead of picking each other up, we know who's going to benefit, whether it's de-dollarization, whether it's, it's the world. We know who benefits from all of this. Most countries of the global south share one common thing, colonialism, the legacy of colonialism. I think Brazil is the same, and which has now, in recent years, morphed into coloniality. And when I speak of coloniality, I speak of something that is different from colonialism. Colonialism denotes political and economic relation in which the sovereignty of a nation or a people rests on the power of another nation, right? Which makes such a nation an empire and that many of these kind of administration ended in the post-world uh, 1945 uh, period. But by coloniality, instead, I refer to those long-standing long patterns of power that emerge as a result of colonialism. But they define culture, they define labor, intersubjectivity relations, knowledge production, well beyond the strict limits of colonial administration. You don't have to be administered.
by another nation. But this continues, and they are persisting, these invisible power structures, and we can see how. So decolonial thinking has provided us with the concept of coloniality of knowledge, power, and being to understand some of the structural inequalities that we are struggling with. And I think I, 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 my, my talk is going to, uh, is, it will, will just uh, highlight one, because in the interest of time, coloniality of knowledge. Uh, and I think with the coloniality of knowledge, it focuses on teasing out epistemological issues, politics of knowledge generation, as well as questions of who generates which knowledge and for what purpose. And this has helped us to unmask how knowledge has been used to assist imperialism and colonialism and into how knowledge has remained Euro-American centric endogenous and indigenous knowledges have been pushed to the margins of society. Africa today is settled with irrelevant knowledge that disempowers rather than empowers individuals and communities. So the discipline of economics is no ex exception here on how it has used knowledge to assist all these social ills, including patriarchy, by relegating women's knowledge into the margin in, by disempowering in very disempowering ways. And my first point, point of entry in strategies will be in the area of knowledge and the area of, 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 of education. Uh, I think we all know the book that was published by uh, uh, Anne-Marie uh, May, maybe she's here, uh, Gender and the Dismal Science, where she gives an account of women's underrepresentation in the discipline uh, of economics, and, and she provides this in a historical context. And, when you read her book, you, you immediately pick up that the foundational knowledge of many disciplines in the social sciences, including economics, is essentially sexist, if not racist. Because they are founded on knowledge produced by a few white men. You are not a seasoned economics if you cannot quote uh, Ricardo. You cannot quote Adam Smith. You cannot quote, uh, uh, of course, they, these disciplines, they have fathers, not mothers, they have fathers, fathers of the discipline. And some of the findings in this study suggest the following, that any women professionals or in economics were highly discriminated. It was even worse if you were a woman of color. Those who were in the profession were undermined. And she also looked at the period between the 19th century and the post-war period. And she looked at the structural and institutional factors that excluded women. And some of these were including the, the practices of hiring in the departments of economics, academic universities, who is being hired in these departments. Educational practices as well, uh, publishing practices, uh, marginalization in academic association as well, and, and so on and so forth, citation, justice, and all of those things. All this has ramifications to what constitutes knowledge in this field, which always favors men. Uh, I would argue that there has been changes somehow in the field, and in the rhetoric, in the rules, maybe in, 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 in the field. And it is not surprising that these biases continues up to today because not a lot has changed between that period of 19th century and the post-war. Many of this, uh, today, we have this unevenly mainly influence on economic systems and theory, and, and they appear throughout academia as well. Uh, and those who are in, acad in the academy will know. Uh, a study by Spencer and colleagues in the US has also shown that uh, in 2014, around 2014, economic doctoral degrees were awarded to women, while uh, sociology and life sciences have become far more. Only 15% and tenor track faculty uh, in, 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 with PhD uh, in this. So, so you can see that the consequences of a male-dominated field, including the favoring types of well-being preferred by men over women, and also gender is always reduced to a binary variable in economic analysis. Uh, you can see missing historical developments leading to segment, 
segmented divisions in systems such as labor market. So there's so many of, of these that I, 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 can, I, can, I, can, I can count off. So the study of economics needs to be decolonized. It needs to take seriously contribution of feminists in analysis. And it's about time that we move from general article and papers and books to policy and practice and to the streets where we find that woman sending Maguina. Uh, we also need to transcend the limited scope of disciplinary worldviews. We need to move towards problem solving discourses. We must also emphasize on social purposes as well and teach students not to be afraid to transgress in their analysis when they are writing their thesis and dissertation. Critiquing and reformulating the status quo imposed by dominant assumptions in scientific generation of economics knowledge. We wouldn't have, have a, a, a book like If Women Counted, if people did not want to transgress. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I, in the interest of time, I, have to, I will stop here. So we also need to structure knowledge towards unity, universal scientific explanation, and also have feedback from both academic and, and, and non-academic. And I think this August uh, forum is able to do that, to draw from academic and, and non-academic. So for me, it will be education, the strategy that I'm offering, strategy uh, training, how we educate, whom do we educate, uh, uh, within this world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we move on now to our third um, presenter, and this is Libo Hong, Libo Hang Di Polo. <laughs> Andy Polo is an activist scholar, academic, international movement builder, and decolonial African feminist of over 25 years standing. Her research interests are in African political economy, states and nationhood, international trade and global financial governance, feminization of poverty and social reproduction, regional integration and impacts of globalization on migration. She draws, heavy, she draws strongly from intersectionality and is using feminist economics, feminist well-being economics, and the political economy of African states to explore the ongoing manifestations of imperialism and coloniality in international trade and international relations. Dipolo is the senior research fellow at feminist activist and advocacy think tank, Trade Collective, founding fellow of the Tabo Mbeki Leadership Institute, and has taught international trade, African feminist theory, international development, political economy, political theory, and race and de decolonial studies across the world. She is also a Lancet Commissioner on Reparations, an ambassador of the Wellbeing Economy Global Alliance, an African Futures Fellow, and takes guidance and inspiration from the histories of the women who have and continue to resist all forms of imperialism. <coughs> To this end, she is committed to excavating contributions of African women to liberation struggles and has written extensively on the hazards of masculinized state curated memory. Dipolo. I'm going to go over there because the mic looks lonely. <laughs> Can you hear me? Good morning. Dumelang, Sanibona, Nimolo, and all protocols are observed. I'm standing also because I think it's important to, speak, uh, to stand and recognize the many women who have gone before, the many feminist ancestors, as I like to call them. And today, in particular, I would like to mention Professor Ama Atta Aidu, who means a lot to the women on, the, on this continent. And I would also like to mention Professor Gidai Mugo, both of whom have recently transitioned. I also want to mention a woman who grew up and was transported not very far from this very place, Sarah Bartman. She was from the Eastern Cape. 
And I speak about her because her body and her disembodiment is a huge important symbol of the origins of racial capitalism, feminization of capitalism, exploitation, and extractivism in that exploitation. Everything about her life is a symbol of so many things that we are still grappling with today and in this room. I also want to greet all the feminist sisters and the feminist mothers, the feminist cousins, and the feminist play friends with whom I walk and talk and breathe, create, imagine, dream, and aspire. Most of you. Yeah, clap for yourselves. And I have to say that being in Cape Town changed this input significantly. I land on this ground that is the bastion of colonial struggle and of the settler colonial project and the birthplace of race capitalism. And it completely shifts everything that I wanted to say. We also have to understand that um, we are standing on what was a prison. This was the breakwater prison. This is a complex space. This is a site of so much exploitation. It was slightly, it was built partly on exploited and exploitative labor, which is both painful and instructive because the past is always with us and we walk with its contradictions. I am grateful to my co-panelists and my sisters in arms because they've used so much of the, com uh, the, the vocabulary that I'm going to also draw on in making these remarks. The one is to say that the, the term and the idea of um, race capitalism has its roots in this country, as I've mentioned. And even if it its use has waned somewhat in this country, um, we are still grappling with seemingly endless legacies and ongoing realities um, in this regard. Uh, race capitalism is imbued with racial distinctions, and from the very beginning, it had to do with the dialectic relationship between racialist exploitation, capitalist exploitation, the capitalization of women's cheap and free labor, and racial domination. Simple as that. South Africa's history doesn't actually begin in 1652, but that ugly part does. The yucky part does. So it doesn't begin with Jan van Riebeek in the same way that America does not begin with Christopher Columbus, but the yucky parts do. <laughs> it doesn't begin with Vasco da Gama um, and his interesting adventures across the world, but the yucky parts do. And in our languaging, we need to be able to frame what the conquest of these people, these men, was. These were not adventurers, and this was not the project of a load of people who looked like Indiana Jones. This was settler colonial impulse, which was driven by capital, sponsored by the state, and sanctioned by their crowns. So anybody who, yeah, yeah, clap, clap. <laughs> So anybody who wants to speak to the notion that the past is not with us and that we are owed nothing in terms of apologies, reparative economics, reparative justice is really living in an island of foolishness. We just saw recently that the Dutch king, I wasn't aware they still have a king, <laughs> was saying something like, whoops, sorry, a few days ago. Um, and for people who have, who stand on land, and some, those who know will know when I say that was unceded, um, will understand that that means very little until the land is returned. It also means very little in the context of the many women whose bodies have been broken and continue to be broken for this land and many lands to flourish. It has to be said also that in that brokenness of these bodies, of these women, as per Sarah Bartman, that many people may not be aware, was originally also a wet nurse. So among many things, she was a polyglot. She spoke several languages. She played the harp. And she was a woman of great intellect and said to have had a charming personality. That's the little that we can glean from her. But what we know that is that the ways in which women's work and the work that women do 
is extracted in this regard is really what gives us the rise to say that, in fact, we are not dealing only with a, a question of settler capitalism, but we are dealing with the feminization of global precarity and the feminization of ongoing global imperialism in multiple forms, in the ways that both of my comrade sisters have already articulated. So a lot of this work draws back to people like Cedric Robinson, who most people don't speak about as often as I would like. I'd rather speak about him than Adam Smith, that's for sure. Um, is black Marxism and how, influ how influential that work has been. And it speaks to the black radical tradition, which also speaks very firmly and very beautifully to the radical feminist traditions, because these are traditions of resistance. These are redis the, the traditions that speak against the status quo. These are the traditions which actually have given us the leverage to be able to claim back our states and claim back nations, even though we're waiting for land. But in some way, shape, or form, we are able to formate and to rethink and reconceptualize what women's economic citizenship could look like and what women's economic personhood looks like, but also what the personhood of black and brown women on this planet looks like. Why do I center black and brown women's personhood? Because we have donated, been extracted from, for over 500 years to the world. Very, 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 very simply. And academics and scholars like, um, I'm not gonna cite white men today, but they are academic scholars who have already done the work to show that the measure that has been taken from black and brown women is exactly what is subsidizing global economics. It is in this context that it seems almost like a fallacy. It's like a trick question to then ask about sustainable livelihoods and sustainable economies. It's also like a trick question to speak about this in the, in the construct and the, and the construction of states which are already gender hostile. Yeah. What does Jayati say gender, what, what? Exploitative. Exploitative. I'm with Jayati, I'm, oh, I'm often with Jayati. Gender exploitative and gender hostile. It is very strange for the periphery and now, to now become the player. So we squeeze you, we exploit you, we extract from you, we invisibilize you, we peripheralize you, but hey, we're gonna mainstream you too. <laughs> so it's a very difficult question to respond to. I also want to then jump into the, I want to jump into this as well, which is, which is um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore and how she has defined and been very helpful in, um, in her utterances on how capital and power how re really rely on, 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 on tight control over laboring bodies, as she says. Um, and she also speaks around moving away from the systemic or structural understandings of discrimination. And she defines racism in relation to death. And she says that it is the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Comrades, scholars, economists, non-economists, this is a matter of simple life and certain death. And I know that many of us are living inside our towers, and I, I have a, a tiny, it's not a tower, but it's a tiny little space in academia. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this to be critical, but I am suggesting that exactly as Professor Paswani has said, so much more of our rigorous thinking has to be around a transformative way of doing, thinking, seeing, writing economics. I lean very strongly on, eco on intersectional economic theory in this regard. And this is the moment for me to make the disclaimer to kindly request for the record that people who have not lived in the embodiment of racism, in the embodiment of heteropatriarchy, in the embodiment of race, of, of race capitalism, and who are not the recipients of the extractivism of any of these systems, kindly be cautious in utilizing 
intersectionality as a tool, as a methodology, as an instrument, and as a footnote on your annual report. I beg you. But to say also that there are several key distinguishing characteristics of contemporary capitalism that are relevant to intersectional economics theory. These speak of domestic divisions of labor. Have I, am I getting taller? And their global roots. These speak to precarization and the production of racialized advantage. They speak to the interlocking mechanisms of financialization, intellectual monopolization that entrench historical and historical inequities. These speak to the global division of labor and its expression of domestic level, which has roots that goes back over centuries and is intimately tied up with histories and her stories of colonialism and empire, as my colleagues has already mentioned and we did not share our notes before we came here this morning. These dynamics shape class divisions along racialized and feminized lines over time until we find ourselves in a situation where racialized sexism and racialized feminization of poverty is almost a social caste, a grid from which there is no intergenerational escape from one time and space to the next time and space. Standing on this unceded land, which is indeed um, the root of um, much of what we understand around the analysis of the feminization of racial capitalism. We can appreciate that there is an intergenerational legacy. There are people who were born unfree long before 1994. They were never going to be free because structurally there was no space for them to be free. We've been given the language of surplus people. We've been given the language of surplus labor. We've been given understandings around the so-called um, dispossessed, the marginalized, the invisibilized, the unseen, and frankly, the unwanted, the superfluous. So there's a whole intergenerational legacy to the notion of what precarization means because some people were born into precarity long before they were even conceptualized. Now this precarity is in fact then um, institutionalized and made official by neoliberal structural adjustment programs which are implemented by IFIs like your usual suspects, the horrible toxic conditionalities of loans and development aid which really should be reparative aid um, or reparations. In the global north, life-sustaining work such as Formal and informal care work, social reproduction, it's, gone a, it's undergone a huge shift. And I think the languaging that COVID, the COVID pandemic gave us was the language of understanding the extent to which the COVID pandemic was not a crisis. It is a crisis which I see has its origins in about 500 years ago. It's not new. None of it is new. Much of this crisis began when your Columbuses and your Dagamas and your Jan van Riebecks began their adventures. Much of this crisis has been, is rooted in the imperial framework and matrix of the different intersections of capitalism, of institutionalized cap capitalism, and the ways in which it insists on instructing women's labor and the labor that women do in different ways. I won't say more about social reproduction and the global care chain and the global, uh, because I'll be, come to the next couple of, I'll be speaking about that later, so come for more, <laughs> quick plug. But to, just safe to say that um, the, 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 the extractiveness of, 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 of the settler project, and when I speak of settler, not only human settlers, now the settlers of transnational corporations, multinationals, your Amazons, the huge disembodying of lands in order to build, um, you know, in order to build you know, Amazon factories and so on and so forth. Yeah. Oh, well, mine says I've got 50 seconds. I'm almost there. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and so forth, which is another form of extractiveness, but is also has its origins in the way that the land and people were extracted from their places of origin. So in this country, many of us will be aware that the, the mining sector, for example, is one that the whole of Southern Africa, it was a Southern African project, 
where men were taken from Malawi, Swaziland, Lesotho, and that still prevails even to this day, right? Um, Botswana, as far away as, um, um, as Zambia, as well, Mozambique, and so forth. And then the extraction of women to go and care for other people's families, for white people's families, at the expense of our own. And yet this trauma is also a trauma that is re... Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, this trauma is a trauma that is also reproduced because remember that in the, in, because of the patriarchal ways of doing and of being, there would also have been then the women who, 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 who were left behind in Europe because, you know, big man has to go ahead voyage on and see the lay of the land. But what does this mean that it has left us with an imprint, a tattoo that suggests that labor can never be, can never be distributed in a particular way, that the benefits of stateness can never be distributed um, equitably. It suggests that until we are able to forge multiple forms of citizenship and of personhood, we will not be able to reimagine what could possibly be anything that's a sustainable, gendered, whatever that means, feminist reality. So I can only close by saying, viva la, la revolution. <laughs> and to say, as Ama Atta Aydu says, I feel the revolutionizing of our continent hinges on the woman question. So I thank you. Welcome to our colony. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dipolo. So our fourth um, finalist who is going to join us online is Evelyn Nyaduera. Evelyn is Associate Professor of Economics at Pennsylvania State University, Dubois, and a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development, Washington, DC. Her research interests include international economics, technological change, and international development, and she has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. Among others, her publications have appeared in World Economy, Journal of Economic Issues, Comparative Economic Studies, and she has also contributed um, to several um, book chapters, The Elements on China's Finance in Africa, and the paradox of gender equality and economic outcomes in sub-Saharan Africa. The role of the role of land rights, yes, <laughs> with Cambridge University Press. Um, she is the editor in chief of um, the journal African Development and co-editor of Gender Development and Technology and was recently featured 2018 in a BBC interview on the services sector in Africa. Evelyn received her PhD in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, an MA in economics from Western Illinois University, both in the United States, and BA in economics and philosophy from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. So Evelyn, are you online? Can we see Evelyn? Yes, she is. Thank you. So, Evelyn, you've got 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
stumps, stumps, stumps. Ah, uh, bad working. Uh, the unpaid care work reduces their mobility and reduces chances of formal uh, economy employment. So we talk about women who, you know, bear the heavy burden of unpaid care work. So it's harder for them to move to the big cities to look for work. And the informal economy tend to provide the alternative. Uh, so the informal economy offers family friendly um, options. And also, uh, many women tend to fall in the informal sector because men uh, have a negative perception of women, especially married women, uh, being in the um, formal employment. Um, also, I mentioned about, uh, you know, the, the informal sector being heavily supported by uh, agriculture. So meaning that women and land are heavily connected. And if we look at the data, uh, for me, it's, I mean, my presentation is more data oriented, so bear with me on that. If you look at the data, we found that more than 60% of Southern Africa's population live in the rural areas. And a large proportion of uh, Southern Africa's population is women. That's over slightly over 50%. So meaning that we have majority of women living in the rural areas. And in many uh, countries now, agriculture sector is the second largest sector, but it contributes more than 50% um, of total employment that is followed by the services and the industry. And a large percent of the female labor force, around uh, roughly about 55%, tend to be employed in the architecture sector. And as we've seen previously, they tend to be contributing uh, family workers. And we also know that from data that women are the biggest producers of food crops. So evidence strongly shows that the livelihoods of many women in Southern Africa depends on land. So in other words, if you talk about the informal sector, you also have to talk about uh, land rights. And I have a presentation later um, on women land rights. So if someone wants to know more, they can attend that presentation. So we see that women and land are interconnected. But if we look at the amount of land that women own, it's actually way much smaller. And this one is regardless of how women acquired this land. And the data showed that only about 31% of women in Southern Africa own land compared to 69% um, of men. And women tend to acquire this land either through the marriage, I mean, uh, purchased from the market system or through marriage. And those who get the land through marriage, they actually don't have, um, you know, secure land rights. They cannot sell that land. Uh, basically, 
they use, I mean, they have the rights to use the land, but they don't have any other rights similar to what their husbands or their male counterparts do have. And land to me, uh, in my interpretation, is similar to the tragedy of the commons for the women whereby they can use, but they don't have, uh, you know, the ownership of, I mean, ownership rights. Uh, so I'm going to leave that, given the amount of time that we have, leave that, tease that out, and we can have questions or discussions later. But I want to move on to the infrastructure development. And I strongly feel that this impacts, obviously, generally, infrastructure is good overall for the economy, for the development. Uh, but it also, I, I feel that it's also, it has to be gendered. Or when you're doing infrastructure development, we have to look at that in gender lens. And Africa, Australia, Southern Africa, has done a, a great job um, in trying to develop the infrastructure. But still, we have a deficit of about 130, 170 billion uh, US dollars um, in terms of power, uh, water, sanitation, roads, ICTs, and so on. That's by the FDB um, estimates. The poor infrastructure has a negative impact on the cost of doing business and growth. It impacts all aspects of, econo of the economy, including human capital development, but the consequences on women uh, are far reaching. African Governments are taking uh, infrastructure investment very seriously. Uh, for example, in 2016, they had invested a total of 286 uh, projects worth $324 billion. However, these infra infrastructure development efforts are not gender sensitive. And again, these are issues that given time, we can talk more about, about them. Um, and I'm just going to look at the different uh, you know, types of infrastructure and just highlight a few things there. Uh, for example, I mean, when you talk about the fiscal infrastructure, we have transportation, uh, water sanitation, we, we talk about energy and so on. We have the social, ICT related, the financial infrastructure. We also can talk about the political uh, infrastructure. But just to give out um, data, um, a few statistics. Um, it's shown that women spend about 20 hours a week on collecting firewood. So not only does it impact their time use, but also using firewood we know and using even charcoal has health consequences on women and girls because they're the ones that spend more time uh, in the kitchen. Also studies show that Africa, African girls uh, and women spend more than 5 billion hours a year on fetching water alone. And sometimes that water is not clean water. So you also not only is, uh, we can think of it in terms of time use, but you also, Think of it um, in terms of health consequences. If you have to fetch water from far away, then it means that how you're going to use that is going to be economized and so on. And that can have some health um, impact. Um, we also talk about you know, um, roads, for example, or basically physical infrastructure. Women moving great distances trying to get the actor produce to the market. And you find these women carrying heavy loads on their heads and they have the children on their backs. They have their little girls tucking along, along probably carrying other uh, produce and so on. So we can talk about that also impacting their education for the girls. We talk about, I mean, if you have roads that um, uh, are not, not tarmac, uh, we don't have electricity, I mean, um, lighting on those roads and these women are come, leaving very early in the morning, coming back late in the night, then we can think of other social ills that can befall these women uh, and girls. And also we can talk about the ICT sector, and I'm going to give you some data on that. So let's talk about the impact uh, on schooling uh, for the girls, obviously, who later become mothers. So for the data, of between 2010 and 2019, average over 2010 and 2019 shows that in Sub-Saharan Africa, fewer than 90 girls um, are enrolled for every 100 boys at the lower secondary level. And that number drops uh, down to 85 at the upper secondary level. At the primary level, actually it's that strong because you have about 95 girls out of 100 boys. But then when you move on to the tertiary level, then that becomes way much uh, way much less. And if we, we can look back, I mean, people tend to um, talk about girls not being so smart compared to boys, but then we can look at those at the infrastructure. 
when girls come at home, they go to fetch firewood, they go to get the water, they spend more time in the kitchen and their mothers taking care of the young, taking care of, you know, the elderly and so on. So in other words, they don't have time to focus on their schooling. Um, they don't have time to develop the social skills that their, you know, uh, their uh, male counterparts are developing and so on. So you, when we look at the outcome in schools, then we tend to blame these girls as not being so smart compared to uh, their male siblings. But really, there are other underlying factors that contribute to that. So what are the barriers of women to education? Obviously, we have attitudes. Uh, you know, that's a different story. But for me, my focus more is look at the domestic, something that policy, um, you know, can be implemented uh, on that is domestic chores. Um, if we can reduce the amount of time that the girls and women spend on domestic chores, then we can reallocate their time for something else. A survey of the children in Cote d'Ivoire found that 68% of boys and 56% of girls think that domestic chores are a women's responsibility. And also we talk about the care burden that I've mentioned. So we know that the fate of girls and women is intertwined because it's the little girls that tend to help their mothers. And that, try, I mean, um, impacts their future life, impacts their earning potential, impacts their, you know, uh, schooling and other aspects of their life. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm just limiting uh, the barriers to women education on those um, two issues, but we have other issues. We have poverty, child marriage, early pregnancies, polygamous marriages, and so on. So those are other things that impact, but my focus is actually um, on those that I've highlighted. Another thing that I want to highlight that's impacted by infrastructure, social infrastructure, is maternal mortality and even infant mortality. So let's look at the maternal mortality, for example. Um, <clears throat> we find that the maternal mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa is way much higher, actually three times that of the world and nine times that of uh, the MENA region. So we find that out of 100,000 uh, lives in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have um, 605 uh, you know, uh, women dying. Uh, so that is something that also, I mean, is infrastructure related and, you know, uh, and it's something that has to be addressed. If we talk about the ICT infrastructure, um, talk about, for example, just look at data for, you know, the share of the population that use internet in sub-Saharan Africa, and we, we disaggregate that by gender. We find that overall, um, more men have access to internet so meaning that more men have access to smartphones compared to uh, to women. And the difference is about 10 percentage point if you look across um, several years. So this access to ICTs. Um, Evelyn, you have to wind for up, example, please. Uh, we do access many things um, on our smartphones, over the Internet, for example, education materials especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we able to access job advertisements or even create entrepreneurial, you know, opportunities uh, online. Um, we have other services that are provided on online platforms, you know, government services and other services that we can access through that, that women cannot. We have information uh, about farming, about health and all that, that women who don't have access to internet and smartphones do not um, get. So these are things that we also have to think about, and I think governments have to take that very seriously. So the question is that how can we harness women uh, potential? So one, obviously what I've said, the informal economy, we have to think seriously about that, uh, that economy. It's here to stay, as we have seen, it creates more jobs, it contributes more to the Africa's, G I mean, Africa's GDP. Uh, it employs more women. Uh, not to mention, again, my focus is on women, but we also we can talk about men as well. So this is a source of economic opportunities that has to, the government has to find a way, um, you know, to, to support the sector, I mean, the, that part of the economy. Um, again, the informal economy with regards to women is related to the land rights. So laws on property, inheritance and ownership have to be very clear, they have to be implemented, they have to be proactive, and I'll talk about that later. And then we, when we go to the infrastructure, the fiscal infrastructure, I've mentioned about the consequences on that. So when, when we develop this infrastructure, we have to be 
gender sensitive. And I'll just give very simple examples. Like if you drive around, um, I mean, many roads in Southern Africa are not tarmacked. Um, and you find some of them, you know, I see documentaries where people spend, um, you know, many days in a very short kilometer um, part. I think my time is up. So I'll just quickly hurry up. So they spend many days on the road. This has consequences on women and all that being raped, uh, you know, time away from the family and all that uh, social infrastructure that has impact on human capital development uh, and so on. So just food for thought before um, I end. Uh, women account for more than 50% of Africa's combined population, but in 2018 generated only 33% of the continent's collective GDP. Africa could add $316 billion or 10% of I mean, to GDP by 2025 if each country makes advances in women, uh, women's equality. And African countries should make bold policy decisions for post-pandemic recovery and the informal economy has to feature prominently in those policies for inclusive, resilient and sustainable structural economic transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've tried to be a bit strict about the timing so that we can open up the floor um, for discussion. And uh, I'm not going to try to summarize um, what our different um, presenters have given us, but I think we've got a lot of food um, for thought and things to reflect on. But the floor is now open for questions, for further contribution and comments. Hi. Maybe you can introduce yourself and then okay. you ask the All question. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamela. I'm from Johannesburg. Thanks to everyone for such an interesting panel discussion. I really like what Evelyn was saying just now about uh, how women and land are interconnected. And I, I, I want to direct this question to Lebu, but <laughs> anyone else can jump in. So just around the land question. So being from South Africa and actually originally being from the north, from Limpopo, um, the land question is such an important question for us. Um, I was sharing with my colleagues this morning, uh, my family is part of a community that has successfully um, claimed back the land. Um, I think it was transferred to the community in 2007. Uh, but for me, I, I just want to know how can we use land to transform um, you know, our lives um, as women? And also just looking at that land claim and how the land has been you know, used and issues around land access for women and how you know, that has been quite restricted. Uh, for women, I even in that community, you know, land use has been quite restricted. How can we use land to transform our lives in, in, in that context of, of land claims and in, in the South African context, given our history? Thanks. We will take a set of questions and then, um, so please show by hand. Okay, I see someone. Hi, I'm Charu. Uh, I'm based at the University of Washington, Bothell, in uh, the state of Washington, USA. So this is a, a comment and a question for uh, Dr. Fiko and uh, Paswana. Uh, I hope I got the pronunciation adequate. Um, I was particularly struck by how both of you highlighted the need for an epistemological shift in terms of how we approached questions of economy and questions of development. Uh, in one case, highlighting decolonial, and in another case, highlighting black Marxist and intersectional thought. Uh, the question is the extent to which economics as a discipline naturalizes the state particularly the nation state, as the instrument through which we will make our change. We tend to use an, a policy advocacy approach, which means that 
our short term and our long term, essentially has the state as our audience. And so given the extent to which the state has been highlighted as a potential limit and a location after colonialism, where uh, we continue to see the, the afterlives, uh, that's one. And two, the extent to which a human rights discourse A human rights discourse underpins concepts of women's rights. What sort, of, uh, what sort of alternatives can we imagine or strategies can we use to infuse our own field with some of this transformative vision? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ayo, and I'm a student at the University College Dublin. And um, my question is for uh, the professor. Something you really said that stood out for me was that students should continue to critique. But I find it really hard to critique. Um, I have recently been taught how to carry out a feminist research. Wonderful. But anytime, because when you carry out a research, you have to build on other research. Although you know the truth, you know what is right, but you need other research for your lit review to be able to arrive to where you want. And I'm finding that I'm not finding lots of feminist, feminist research or lots of research that backs up my view. So in many cases, I have to leverage on research that are not feminist in nature. And
So on the on the land, let me start on the land question very quickly. Uh, I think the land question is one that really ties the whole theme of the conference together in a way because really this is part of how we reach a sustainable world. So in Brazil, for example, forty six percent of uh, emissions come from deforestation, twenty seven percent from the agricultural activity. So in Brazil, it's not about changing our productive structure; it's by changing our exploitative uh, type of uh, production, primary production. And really, we came out of a government that was proud to say that they did not do a single meter of demarcation for indigenous population. And we're now in one that was supported by the land reformist movement. But still, it's a very difficult subject in Brazil that people don't dare to talk about. We really need to do a reform in Brazil. This has to do with, uh, with giving back what was stolen from people. And it is one of the ways of, of building this more sustainable way of producing as well. So in terms of, the, of, uh, for in, in terms of Charu's question, I think one of the issues we usually get is that we have these huge questions that we don't know the answer. We don't know, we can't just imagine what is this world post-state uh, that we need to build, and it kind of freezes us. So part of what I wanted to bring today is more, we don't know what we're trying to build together, we just know how we go about to actually build something. It is constructive. So really, it is about creating regional alliances, it is about the Global South together, reimagining this future, and step by step doing some small things, which I believe the state still has a place in trying to change a little bit, so it shifted the forces and so people survive along the way because it is a matter of survival. And finally, to I, I, Iowa, I, Iowa uh, I, I believe like what, yeah, I, I don't know if she's here. So I'll, sorry? Okay, I'll talk to her later. I think she needs more support. That's what I believe. <laughs> okay, we are actually eating into... We've eaten into our um, tea break by one minute. Can we go for another five? Ten, so it's okay. We don't have much time. Oh, Ev oh my goodness. Sorry, Evelyn. I, I, I forgot to turn to Evelyn. Is Evelyn still there? Okay, Evelyn isn't here. The panelists are going to be with us, so you do have an opportunity to interact with the panelists. I have a few housekeeping question um, information to give you, please. So the first housekeeping question is that the um, IT people have not received this, um, the presentations for the next session. So please make sure that you give them your presentations. And then just to let you know, that the conference venue is split between two buildings. So in the, because when you go online, you're going to see um, exhibition hall, LT2, and all that sort of thing. OK. So um, in this building, we have the auditorium where we are. And then we have venues four, five, and six. OK. Now, in the building across the parking lot, we have the lecture theaters, that's the LT. So we have lecture theaters two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we have the exhibition hall, okay? And then we do have student volunteers on hand to direct you. Okay, so enjoy your tea break. Thank you all very much for an interesting session.